All right, so you'll, you'll have an Excel file, so I'll break it up into teams. Um, some teams, I'll probably do it by row, and I'll start with the top row on Excel, so that, because I don't want, you know, you, you can see other people's computers, so we'll probably start with the top row. I think you're on the second row, Andrea, and so you'll probably go last on this question, but so you'll, you'll get this file in Blackboard with the question there, and it's just a matter of working it out. So you start with the interest rate. The interest rate is 576 and it's monthly. So you see that the rate's 576 and it's a monthly payment. So you do 0 0.0576 divided by 12. That gives you the rate. And then the time is 15 years and monthly. So you do 15 times 12. This is a present value problem because he's borrowing money. And so we're gonna do time, um, beginning balance, interest, payment, and ending balance. You don't have to be fancy in Excel. I don't need, you know, full titles, just as long as I can tell what it is. You start off with period one, and then you're gonna add one to that. So plus one, plus, plus the first period, plus one, that gives you, Two, we need to go down 180. So I'm gonna do control N down at the end, there's my 180. So I got my time picked up. My beginning balance is he's borrowing 5,200,000. His interest is gonna be that beginning balance times the rate. You have to hit the F4 to lock it in with the dollar signs. If you're using a Mac, it's probably the function F4 or something. The payment is going to be the um, five, two million. And this time it's a present value problem. So you divide it by the present value interest factor of annuity. So five million divided by that number. Then your ending balance is your beginning balance plus the interest minus the payment. Looks exactly like cell application one. The next period, you do have to set up the first period and then set up the second period because you can't copy down the first period. But so there's your first, your beginning balance is the ending balance from the previous period. Your interest, if you locked it in, should work fine. Beginning balance times the rate. Your payment, you can just reference that payment. And in any balance, you can copy that down. Once you have the second period down, you can just copy that down then do control down and see that the end is zero. And that's all you get. If you do all of that, you get, you get full credit for the question. All right, any questions there? So question two, here's the problem. It's all set up. I even set up the cash flows for you. So all you gotta do is put the titles in there. You've got time. So time is gonna be equal today. And then you're gonna take that plus 183 for the first year, then the next one plus 365. It can be, if you wanna adjust for leap year or whatever, I don't care. So here, I'm gonna adjust for leap year, but you don't need to. I like them all being the same day, 30, 30, 30, 30, but that's not that critical. You can add 183, adds 365, as long as, you do something along that line, you can add 365.25. What are you going to do? I'm not that picky on that. So um, anything close to that. So let's do the net present value first. Net present value. So we have a rate, right? So you probably want to type the rate in there somewhere. So there's the cash flows, 415, 185, 193, 75. I've already keyed that for you. So their rate is 4.8%. Your discount rate, y'all see that up here at the top, the cost of capital. So net present value is equal XMPV. And Bill Gates shows you exactly what you need, the rate, the values, and the dates. And that gives you, you know, do, do some formatting so that you, um, you know, so you, you you can, you can tell what the answer is. Don't, don't let it be messy. Uh, so 13, 154, 56. 
Same thing with the IRR, you do equal X IRR. Here you have the values and the dates and you don't have to do the guess. And it gives you a seven and a half percent or 7.49% IRR. And then you got to do the payback. So the payback's a tough one. Uh, for the payback, you need to get the cum cumulative MPV, and then you need the annual change in MPV. So those two columns. So the payback's the toughest part. So some, some students might just give up on that. It probably will cost them, they may only get 70% credit, they leave that out. But the cumulative PVV, MPV, you start off with a deficit, and then you do equal X MPV, and here you just have the first two. Oh, you have the rate first, sorry. Rate, and you wanna lock that in. Then you have the first two periods, but you wanna lock in the first row. And then you have the time. And again, you wanna lock in the first row. So the net present value at the end of the first year is negative 230. 3, 7, 12, and you should be able to copy that down. You know you did it right. The very last one matches your net present value, and it does. Then we're going to do the change in the MPV. So you do that. You do year one minus the year zero. So the first year I added 188. The second year added seven, 179. And the third year. Now here, you don't have to do that fancy formula that I did. Um, the if function, you don't need to. So if I were you, I would just say, okay, how much of the first year you need? Well, you're still negative to end of the first year, so you still need the full year. Still negative after the second year. At the end of the third year, you had a deficit, starting deficit of 53,000 in a year where you gained 66. So you just take minus the deficit divided by the current year. And the sum of that is your discounted kind of payback. And here I made it a little tricky. You see their, their cutoff is 2.5. So here, you, all I need for the Y is except because MPV is greater than zero, except because IRR is greater than the WAC. Here, reject because payback is greater than the standard of 2.50. That gives you full credit on the Y part of the question. All right. So if you do that, you would get full credit on, on this one. I think the payback is probably the hardest part of this. I think you ought to probably not have any trouble at all. But you see how I didn't put, I don't need the, I'm not giving you credit for putting the, the fancy um if function in there, you can just, if, if a cumulative is still negative, you need a whole, the entire year. Once it switches from negative to positive, then just take the negative amount and the minus the negative amount divided by how much extra MPV you got the next year. So you had to go through, you know, 53,000 versus 66,000. You had to go through 80% of the year before you went positive. So let's, the other problems are all going to be by hand with calculator. So this third question has got a lot of information in it, but let's just go to the questions themselves. So the first one is determine the beta and apply it at the cap M. So for the beta, this is F5. So remember for this part of the problem, you have four things to do, the revenue sensitivity. I'm gonna say, Tech B to B business. So cyclical company beta greater than one. The second one is operating leverage. I'm going to say uh, high, highly. Paid salaried workforce and 
So let's go look at here. That's where you look at the, the standard deviation of their margins. Their standard deviation of their margin is above average. So I'm going to say N standard deviation of net margin, which I can type. Above average, implying higher than average fixed cost raising beta. And my, my keyboard, for some reason, ignores letters as I typed them. And the next one, financial leverage, very, very easy. Tech companies usually have low financial leverage, but let's go see if that's true for F5. Their debt to equity is below average. They're, they're ranked 34th. Their debt to equity is 30% versus average 56% for the market. So below average debt to equity, lowering beta somewhat. You can put the numbers in there. And then the last one is history. So history, you can see the median's at 125, and it's kind of all, all over the place. Has been, so some, I think we actually did this problem, didn't we, in class? So um, this is the same problem, so I'm just repeating it again. So I think some teams use like 1.1. Um, I'm going to say 1.1 to 175. But, you know, this part is pretty subjective. I'm going to say 1.25 is median and consistent with all four discussions. So I will use 1.25, but there are multiple answers here. And then here, what we need, we're going to do the KE. It's going to equal the risk-free rate plus beta times the market risk premium. So here's just a matter of plugging in the numbers. The risk-free rate you're gonna use for stocks, for KE, you're gonna use the 10-year treasury. So that's 2.9%. And remember on the exam, don't type percents, do everything in decimals, plus beta 1.25 times the market risk premium. You just have to find it. But uh, there it is, market risk premium, equity risk premium, 4.9%. That's going to equal 0.0903, if I did it correctly. All right, so that answers that question. All of this is required as your answer, so... Make sure you have all of those pieces. I'm going to keep going unless someone interrupts me. I'm not going to ask for questions. The WAC is going to equal the weight of debt times the cost of debt times one. And I do recommend you write the entire formula down. So I know you know the formula that way. If you have a math error, I can correct that. So we just got to fit these pieces in. Let's get the weights. The weight of debt is going to equal. So we just got to get those numbers. We just did this problem last week so we should be able to find it they have 750 in debt and 2250 in equity so 750 750 divided by 750 plus 2250 and that equals 0.25 weight of equity equals one minus 0.25 or 0.75. Cost of debt is going to equal the risk free rate plus the spread. Here, you see that their only debt, 15 year debt, but issued 13 years ago. So it's two years debt. It's rated triple B plus. So two year debt, the two year treasury is 272. Two, two, and the, the spread is 85 because it's triple B plus. So 85, and I'll keep forgetting the number, 85 and 272. 
And again, type everything as decimals. If you're not sure about the 85, you can do 85 divided by 10,000. Or you can just type 0 0.0085. You add all that together, you get 0 0.0. Um, 357. So we've got the first two things, 0.25 times 0 0.0357 times one minus the tax rate. The tax rate was given above 25%. That's 0 0.75 times 0 0.0903. And that gives you a whack of 0 0.0744. We just did that as a team question, so I'm going to keep on moving along. Um, the bonds, $1,000. And the coupon, I think, was 6%. So 6% coupon. So base, $1,000. Coupon is 6%. So cash flow equals a thousand times point zero six divided by two or thirty dollars. The effective yield. So our KD is the same as before. That doesn't change. Point zero three five seven. The effective yield is one plus point zero three five seven divided by two, raised to the second minus one. And that's going to equal 0 0.0360. Um, and then you just set it up as a table. We need um, time, cash flow, discount rate, and discounted cash flow. So we need four columns. We need the titles, and then we're going to have four cash flows, right? It's two years, but every six months, we're going to need five rows. So we have time. This you're going to be doing with paper and pencil, so you know you don't have to worry about – you You won't have um, more document to work with. Cash flow, discount factor and discounted cash flow. So your time is going to be 0 0.5, 1.0, 1.5, and 2.0. Your cash flows are going to be 30, 30, 30, 1,030. Discount factors are going to be 1 divided by one plus 0 0.036 raised to the time 0 0.5 and then to the first. And, and so it's be 0 0.9825, 0 0.9652, 0 0.9483, 0 0.9317. Make sure you practice this with a, um, a calculator if you're used to doing this in Excel because you know you, you may have some problems here. You don't, so make sure you're practicing, especially that exponent key. And so when we do all of that, you get discounted cash flows of 29.47, 28.96, 28.45, and 959.63. And so the sum equals 1046.51. Uh, question uh, for the for the coupon formula. I know it's face times your. Uh, I believe it was a uh, the the oh yeah the times a coup the times a coupon. So right. is is two uh is two like how many is that how many years is that is that always going to be two? No, the two is because. But corporate bonds and treasury bonds pay interest twice a year. It has nothing oh, to do okay, with okay. Okay, 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 okay. Yeah, I was just double it's checking. 20 year, it could be a 20 year bond, you're still going to take the coupon divided by two. It only has to do that interest is paid every six months. So oh, in six months, $30. In a year, you get $30. In a year and a half, you get $30. And then in two years, you get 1030 
Oh, okay. That's okay. The of setup. They don't do that on the fact exam. They assume they're annual. Okay. Uh, but that's that's actually not the way the world works in reality. <laughs> okay, I'll just double check. Double check in. Thanks. Oh, and uh, the discount free uh, discounted cash flows. Uh, the way you got that is, I believe you thirty times point nine eight two five. Yeah. Is multiply across. Okay, sounds good. Thank you. All right. In the stock formula, you have two, three formulas here. You have earnings, given discount model, and age model. So cap earnings equals EPS zero times one plus inflation divided by KE minus inflation. DDM equals dividend zero times one plus long-term growth divided by KE minus term growth. I should have had parentheses here. And then the H model is the exact same thing as the DDM, but we're just gonna add that one little section in the middle. So it's really not that many formulas because they're all so similar. So you're just gonna take plus the zero times H times short-term growth minus long-term growth. So that's our formulas. We already know the KE, we did that above. Or the one I'm using is 903. And so the question is what are our other assumptions? So you can just see them up there. They're all just given. Inflation is two and a half percent. Long-term growth is five percent. There's your dividend and your earnings per share. Short-term growth is a fifteen percent, given in this paragraph right here, and your age is five. So if we take all of that, we got all the assumptions that we need. So EPS zero is 5.44 times one plus inflation divided by, and here's where we're gonna use whatever number you came up with. In this case, it's 903. Make sure you have parentheses there, 903 minus 0 0.025. And that's gonna give you 85.46, and then here, your dividend zero, 3.27 times one plus 0 0.05 divided by 0 0.0903 minus 0 0.05, and that will equal 85.30. And then here, it's the same formula again, just did. We'll add plus 3.27 times my H. My H is five because we say 10 years down here. So it's half of whatever that is times my short term rate is 15% minus my long term rate. And we do all of that. Oops. Uh, okay, I guess I'm okay. 125.93, if you want to check it, you can just take the second part of this formula and see what that is. And that equals 40.62. So 40.62 plus 85.30 equals 125 point, well, more or less, it's kind of rounding, but... Um, so yeah, there's some rounding issues here, but without the rounding, um, the 4262 is 0.1, the 83, 83. So yeah, it just, it barely rounds the two or whatever. So it's, it's close enough.
So it's that way you know that this $85 plus this middle part of the formula, if you add those two together, you should get the age model. You don't have to do this check, but you can if you want to just to double check. All right, so that one's fairly straightforward. Ah. Boy. I don't like this computer. It's just really tough to use. All right, EVA. Um, so here you're gonna, you need to figure out economic earnings. It's gonna equal accounting profit. We did this one in class too, right? Plus depreciation, plus interest expense. So in this case, our accounting profit is minus 18,200. Our depreciation is uh, 65,000. Our interest expense is 43,200. So that gives us an economic profit of 90,000 exactly. Our cost of capital is going to equal debt. Our debt is 600,000 because you can see that she borrowed 600,000 times our debt rate is 7.2%. Again, type it as decimals, not as, not as a percent. And that's 43,200. It should be the same as what's on the income statement, right? Some of y'all on the application because in the first application problem, the interest and the accounting profit were the same. Some people were pulling the wrong line. So there was a few people had the wrong interest line. So make sure you double check that. The equity side, she invested 200,000 of her own money. And she's 18% of that. That's just given in the problem. If you're looking up there and that comes out to um, 36,000. And so the, the total WAC is 79,200. The EVA is then is going to equal 90,000 minus 79,200, which equals 10,800. The EVA spread equals 10,800. Divided by the total capital, which here it's um, 600,000 plus 200,000. So that equals 1.25%. You whack in percents equals 79,000 divided by. 600,000 plus 200,000. Which equals 0 0.099. And your return on capital equals 90,000 divided by 600,000 plus 200,000. And that equals 11.25%. So again, our 0.11.1125. So 0.1125. Oh, I've got a EVA spread is 135. There's something wrong with my number somewhere. It's 135. Yeah, that's 135. All right. So I had a type on the first one. So 1125 minus 99 nine should give you 135. All right.
the next one, maybe the easiest, we know that var equals the mean minus the number of standard deviations times the standard deviation, which equals here, the mean is 0%. The number of standard deviations, well, their risk tolerance is 125. So risk tolerance equals 0 0.0125. One minus 0 0.0125 equals point. Nine eight seven five. So the table value sorry. So we go find nine eight seven five in the table. Nine eight. Seven five, there it is, 2.24, 2.24. So zero minus 2.24 times our standard deviation, 1.6, And that's gonna equal 0 0.0358. So our bar, in dollars equals point zero. Now I know you get a negative number. Remember, ignore the negative number and just, just use the absolute number. We always know var is 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 a loss. Times our portfolio. What is our portfolio? A hundred million. So that comes out to three point five eight. The budget is three. So by late budget, taking too much risk. All right, pretty straightforward question. Oh, can I see how you got the table value again? Yeah, so their risk tolerance is 125. Mm -hmm. You take one minus that and you get 0.9875. You gotta find that in the table, 9875. There it is right there. Yeah. And so you look at row value 2.2, column value 04, you add those together, 2.24, and that becomes the number of interviations. All right, perfect. Thanks. Sure. All right. I'm not gonna give you the full answer on this last one. You have to look at the class notes, but we can do the labels real quick. So the y-axis, you got to look and see if the optimal point is something that's coming down, then your y-axis is going to be your cost of capital. If the y-axis is something going up so that the optimal point is the highest thing on the graph, then your y-axis would then be the value of the firm. But here it's cost of capital. The x-axis is always, doesn't matter what graph I give you, it's always um, percent allocation to debt. So you start at zero where you're 100% equity, and then at the end, you're 100% debt, right? Line one, your lowest line is always going to be your cost of debt. Line two, the middle line is always going to be your whack. Line three, the highest line is always going to be your cost of equity. And then your four, wherever that whack is the lowest, is Minimum whack, 
and max firm value. And then you'll have to look in the class notes, come up with your essay. Uh, I don't want to do that again because I could take another 20 minutes, but you're going to talk about you know, the impact of debt on your equity cost of capital as you use more debt. Even though debt's cheaper, your cost of capital doesn't change because your beta goes up, except for the fact that debt's tax deductible. So your WAC actually does decline because of the tax yield of debt, but at some point it starts going up because of the uh, bankruptcy costs. So there is some optimal level where you maximize that balance between the tax shield of debt and the bankruptcy costs, you find that optimal level, that's your minimum whack, and that will be your maximum firm value. So I just said it in a nutshell, what you're looking for. All right. So that's it, that's the exam. And it took me, you know, even with the phone call interruption, um, you know, you can, you've got two and a half, almost three hours to do it. So you should have plenty of time to do it. But do make sure you practice after those first two questions, you practice using a calculator. I think the debt, the bond valuation is the only one I'm a little worried about. The others, uh, the stock valuation, the WAC, um, the EVA, the VAR, those with a calculator, no big deal. Just make sure with the bond that you do some practice to make sure how to use those exponent keys. It's about the only place that you need the exponent key. So make sure you got your calculator down. You haven't been practicing so much in Excel, you can't do it on paper.